Story 12 of Lucy Maud Montgomery's Short Stories from 1904. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kata. Short Stories from 1904 by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Story 12 Penelope's Party Waste. Penelope's party waste. It's perfectly horrid to be so poor, grumbled Penelope. Penelope did not often grumble, but just now, as she sat typing with one pink type finger her invitation to Blanche Anderson's party, she felt that grumbling was the only relief she had. Penelope was seventeen, and when one is seventeen, and cannot go to a party because one hasn't a suitable dress to wear, the world is very apt to seem a howling wilderness. I wish I could think of some way to get you a new waist, said Doris, with what these sisters called the poverty pucker, coming in the center of her pretty forehead. If your black skirt were sponged and pressed and rehung, it would do very well. Penelope saw the poverty pucker and immediately repented with all her impetuous heart having grumbled. That pucker came often enough without being brought there by extra warriors. Well, there is no use sitting here sighing for the unattainable, she said, jumping up briskly. I'd better be putting my gray matter into the algebra instead of wasting it plotting for a party dress that I certainly can't get. It's a sad thing for a body to lack brains when she wants to be a teacher, isn't it? If I could only absorb algebra and history as I can music, what a blessing it would be. Come now, Dory dear, smooth that pucker out. Next year I shall be earning a priceless salary which we can squander on party gowns at will if people haven't given up inviting us by that time in sheer despair of every being able to conquer our exclusiveness. Penelope wanted of the her detested algebra with a loaf, but the pucker did not go out of Doris' forehead. She wanted Penelope to go to that party. Penelope has studied so hard all winter, and she hasn't gone anywhere, thought the older sister wistfully. She is getting discouraged over those examinations, and she needs just a good, jolly time to hearten her up, if it could only be managed. But Doris did not see how it could. It took every cent of her small salary as typewriter in an uptown office to run their tiny establishment and keep Penelope in school dresses and books. Indeed, she could not have done even that much if they had not owned their little cottage. Next year it would be easier if Penelope got through her examinations successfully, but just now there was absolutely not a spare penny. It is hard to be poor. We are a pair of misfits, said Doris, with a petty and little smile, thinking of Penelope's uncultivated talent for music and her own housewifely gifts, which had small chance of flowering out in her business life. Doris dreamed of pretty dresses all that night and thought about them all the next day. So it must be confessed, did Penelope though she would not have admitted it for the world. When Doris reached home the next evening, she found Penelope hovering over a bulky parcel on the sitting room table. I'm so glad you have come, she said with an exaggerated gasp of relief. I really don't think my curiosity could have borne the strain for another five minutes. The expressman brought this parcel an hour ago, and there's a letter for you from Aunt Adela on the clock shelf, and I think they belong to each other. Hurry up and find out. Dory, darling, what if it 
should be uh, a present of some sort of or other. I suppose it can't be anything else, smiled Doris. She knew that Penelope had started out to say a new dress. She cut the strings and removed the wrappings. Both girls start. Is it? It isn't. Yes, it is. Doris Hunter. I believe it's an old quilt. Doris unfolded the odd present with a care feeling of disappointment. She did not know just what she had expected the package to contain, but certainly not this. She laughed a little shakily. Well, we can't say after this that Aunt Adela never gave us anything, she said, when she had opened her letter. Listen, Penelope, my dear Doris, I have decided to give up housekeeping and go out west to live with Robert. So I am disposing of such of the family heirlooms as I do not wish to take with me. I am sending you by express your grandmother Hunter's kill, kilt. It is a handsome article still and I hope you will prize it is you should. I, it took your grandmother five years to make it. There is a bit of the wedding dress of every member of the family in it. Love to Penelope and yourself, your affectionate Aunt Adela Hunter. I don't see its beauty, said Penelope with a great grimace. It may have been pretty once, but it is all faded now. It is a monument of patience, though. The pattern is what they call little thousands, isn't it? Tell me, Dory, does it argue a lack of proper respect for my ancestors? that I can't feel very enthusiastic over this heirloom, especially when Grandmother Hunter died years before I was born. It was very kind of Aunt Adela to send it, said Doris dutifully. Oh, very, agreed Penelope trolley. Only don't ever ask me to sleep under it. I would give me the nightmare. Oh, this last was a little squeal of admiration as Doris turned the Killed, over and brought to view the shimmering lining. Why, the wrong side is ever so much prettier than the right, exclaimed Penelope. What lovely old-timey stuff, and not a bit faded. The lining was certainly very pretty. It was a soft, creamy yellow silk with a design of brocaded pink rosebuds all over it. That was a dress Grandmother Hunter had when she was a girl, said Doris absently. I remember hearing out Adela speak of it. When it became old-fashioned, Grandmother used it to line her kilt. I declare it is as good as new. Well, let us go and have tea, said Penelope. I decidedly hungry. Besides, I see the poverty pucker coming, but the kilt in the spare room. It is something to possess an heirloom after all. It gives one a nice, important family feeling. After tea, when Penelope was patently grinding away at her studies and thinking dolefully enough of the near approaching examinations, which she dreaded, and of teaching, which she confidently expected to hate, Doris went up to the tiny spare room to look at the wrong side of the kilt again. It would make the loveliest party waste, she said under her breath. Creamly yellow is Penelope's color, and I could use that bit of old black lace and those knots of velvet ribbon that I have to trim it. I wonder if Grandmother Hunter's reproachful spirit will forever haunt me if I do it. Doris knew very well that she would do it, had known it ever since she had looked at that lovely lining and the vision of Penelope's vivid face and red-brown hair rising above a waist of the quaint old silk had flashed before her mental sight. That night, after Penelope had gone to bed, Doris ripped the lining out of Grandmother Hunter's silk kilt. If Aunt Adela saw me now, she laughed softly, to herself as she worked. In the three following evenings, Doris made the waist. 
she thought it a wonderful bit of good luck that Penelope went out each of the evenings to study some especially difficult problems with a school chum. It will be such a nice surprise for her, the sister mused jubilantly. Penelope was surprised as much as the tender, sisterly heart could wish the, when Doris flashed out upon her triumphantly and the evening on the party with the black skirt nicely pressed and rehung and the prettiest waist imaginable, a waist that was a positive creation of dainty rose best sprinkled silk with a girdle and knots of black velvet. Doris Hunter, you are a veritable little witch. Do you mean to tell me that you conjured that perfectly lovely thing for me out of the lining of Grandmother Hunter's kilt? So Penelope went to Blanche's party and her dress was the admiration of every girl there. Mrs. Fairwater, who was visiting Mrs. Anderson, looked closely at it also. She was a very sweet old lady with silver hair, which she wore in delightful old-fashioned puffs, and she had very bright dark eyes. Penelope thought her altogether charming. She looks as if she had just stepped out of the frame of some lovely old picture, she said to herself, I wish she belonged to me, I just love to have a grandmother like her, and I do wonder who it is I've seen who looks so much like her. A little later on the knowledge came to her suddenly, and she thought with inward surprise, why, it is Doris, of course, if my sister Doris lives to be seventy years old, and wears her hair in pretty white puffs, she will look exactly as Mrs. Fairwater does now. Mrs. Fairwater asked to have Penelope introduced to her, and when they found themselves alone together, she said gently, My dear, I am going to ask a very impertinent question. Will you tell me where you got the silk of which your waist is made? Poor Penelope's pretty young face turned crimson. She was not troubled with false pride by any means, but she simply could not bring herself to tell Mrs. Fairwater that her waist wa was made out of the lining of an old heirloom quilt. My Aunt Adela gave me, gave us the material, she stammered, and my elder sister Doris made the waist for me. I think the silk once belonged to my grandmother Hunter. What was your grandmother's maiden name? asked Mr. Fairwater eagerly. Penelope Saverne. I am named after her. Mrs. Fairwater suddenly put her arm about Penelope and drew the young girl to her, her lovely old face aglow with delight and tenderness. Then you are my grandniece, she said. Your grandmother was my half-sister. When I saw your dress, I felt sure you were related to her. I should recognize that rosebud silk if I came across it in Tibet. Penelope Saverne was the daughter of my mother by her first husband. Penelope was four years older than I was, but we were devoted to each other. Oddly enough, our birthdays fell on the same day, and when Penelope was twenty and I sixteen, my father gave us each a silk dress of this very material. I have mine yet. Soon after this our mother died and our household was broken up. Penelope went to live with her aunt and I went west with father. This was long ago, you know when traveling and correspondence were not the easy matter of course things they are now. After a few years I lost touch with my half-sister. I married out west and have lived there all my life. I never knew what had become of Penelope, but tonight when I saw you come in that waist made of the rosebud silk, the whole past rose before me and I felt like a girl again. My dear, I am a very lonely old woman, with nobody belonging to me. You don't know how delighted I am 
to find that I have two grand nieces. Penelope had listened silently like a girl in a dream. Now she patted Mrs. Fairweather's soft old hand affectionately. It sounds like a storybook, she said gaily. You must come and see Doris. She is such a darling sister. I wouldn't have had this waste if it hadn't been for her. I will tell you the whole truth. I don't mind it now. Doris made me party waste for me out of the lining of an old silk guild of Grandmother Hunters that Aunt Adela sent us. Mrs. Fairwater did go to see Doris the very next day, and quite wonderful things came to pass from that interview. Doris and Penelope found their leaves and plants changed in the twinkling of an eye. They were both to go and live with Aunt Esther, and Mrs. Fairwater had said they must call her. Penelope was to have and last her launched for musical education and Doris was to be the home girl. You must take the place of my own dear little granddaughter, said Aunt Esther. She died six years ago and I have been so lonely since. When Mrs. Fairweather had gone, Doris and Penelope looked at each other. Pinch me, please, said Penelope. I'm, I'm half afraid. I'll wake up and find I have been dreaming. Isn't it all wonderful, Doris Hunter? Doris nodded radiantly. Oh, Penelope, think of it. Music for you, somebody to pet and fuss over for me. And such a dear, sweet auntie for us both. And no more contriving party wastes out of all silk linings, laughed Penelope. But it was very fortunate that you did it for once, sister mine. And no more poverty packers. She concluded. End of Penelope's party waste. Recording by Kata.